There is a direct relationship between our faith, our theology, and our actions in the world, what we put into the world. Things that seem completely removed from the realm of theology, horrid things like gun ownership, horrid things like racism or the destruction of our environment, all of these are intimately linked to our faith to our theology, because these are the incarnations, these are the incarnate actions of our faith into the world. We may think that there is a world for God and a world outside God, a world in which our brains are the ultimate leaders, the ultimate masters, where our brains can freely, independently upon our faith, discern what is right and what is wrong, but that is entirely false. Unless your faith, unless your theology informs and shapes your philosophy of life, your brains, your political ideology, you are unavoidably going to end up with your brain, your philosophy, or your political ideology shaping your faith, shaping your theology. You either have God as your God, and then theology, knowledge of that God, will inform every single aspect of your life, will filter every single decision that you are going to make in your life, or you are going to end up building your God, building your theology, your image, your knowledge of this created God, based on the idol whom you are worshipping as God. Because we are all worshippers. We may think, some of us, that we can be free of faith, free of worship, but we are all worshippers. All human beings worship one God or another. And that can vary from the living God, the Holy Trinity, all the way down to something as low and as temporary as dust, rotten dust, because what else is our brain, and what else is our philosophy and our political ideology in this world? Something as seemingly unimportant, something as fleeting and contemporary as a decision to wear a mask or not to wear a mask, that refusal says enormous amounts about your faith, and about who your true God is, and where your hope of salvation actually lies. I keep getting messages, and usually not very kind, telling me that I should stick to matters of theology, telling me that I should walk away and abandon these worldly topics, and that we should be only informed by our theology. And I completely, fully agree with that. I agree that we should be informed 101% by our theology and our faith in every single thing we do. The difference is that I do not believe that theology comes from a book. The difference is that I do not believe that theology, knowledge of God, comes from reading a bunch of books, the way you learn about history or geography or literature. You just read a certain literature and that body of texts will give you knowledge about that particular topic. This is where I know that I am right, because I am in agreement with everything the Church has taught from the Holy Apostles all the way to this day. Theology, knowledge of God, does not come from a book. Knowledge of God comes from God alone. Knowledge of God comes from the Holy Spirit who descends in the being of a person and teaches that person the things of Christ. This is what Christ himself has told us, and this is what I believe. Why do I, as a monastic, keep addressing these topics that are not immediately linked in our brains to our theology?
Why do I, as a monastic, keep talking about things like gun ownership or climate change or racism or conspiracy theories? I do it because these are the reality of our lives. I do it because our lives consist of these things. And depending on how we respond to these things, our eternal fate will be determined as well. I do it because I want to follow Christ's commandments in the knowledge that if I obey Christ and if I follow his commandments, the Holy Spirit will descend upon me and the Holy Spirit will teach me about Christ. I do these insignificant uh, passing contemporary things because depending on how I react to these things, and this applies to all of us, it's not just about me, depending on how we react to these things, we shall be given true knowledge, true theology of the true God or not. God gave us two commandments. God gave us the commandment to love him and to love our neighbor. And the first commandment is impossible for us. The simple fact that God phrases it as in um, do your best, basically, to love God, rather than a complete description of what that love looks like. God only says, do your best. Love God with all your might, all your mind, all your heart, all your being, everything that you are. Just do your best to love God. But the depth, the ultimate perfection of that particular commandment is beyond our ability here on earth. The second commandment, though, to love our neighbor is completely within our abilities. We are called to love our neighbor as ourselves. Depending on this second commandment and how I love my neighbor, I manifest my love for my Creator. Do you remember, and this is the key to the relationship between the two commandments, to love God and to love the neighbor, do you remember Christ's last words for Peter? If you love me, love them. If you love me, shepherd them. If you love me, feed them, feed my sheep, feed my flock. It is impossible for us, created beings, while we are still here in this fallen world, in this fallen state of our beings, to fully love God. It is impossible for us to fully, perfectly fulfill the first commandment, but we can manifest our love for God by loving in a visible way, in an incarnate way, our neighbor. Our neighbor is our book of theology. Everything else, from the Gospels to the writings of the Holy Fathers, everything in the holy tradition of the Church are instructions and guides and teachings about how to love our neighbor, how to read this living book, how to study this living book. My neighbor, my brother and my sister, is my entry into the kingdom. My brother and my sister is the only book we have to study God and to learn about God in a real, meaningful way. There is a beautiful story, I think, in the life of St. Ambrose from Optina. The Optina elders are a treasure to Christianity. If you haven't read their lives, I strongly recommend and encourage you to do so. There's a story in the life of St. Ambrose, who is the greatest among the holy elders of that monastery, about him wasting enormous amounts of time discussing the most insignificant 
topics, the most insignificant things with the simple peasants around the monastery. There is this particular story about people who were waiting, queuing for hours and hours, waiting to see him and to receive advice and a blessing. Things that had to completely turn around their lives. People with uh, deadly diseases, people who were in life-threatening situations. And St. Ambrose spent hours talking to this old peasant lady about her cow. She had lost her cow and she was desperate because she couldn't find the cow. And St. Ambrose invested as much time as necessary in order to calm down the heart of this old woman and at the end to tell her how and where to find that cow. And when he was confronted by the angry people waiting for him, when they asked him, why didn't you address our questions, the deep questions that have to do with our lives, and you wasted this precious time discussing a wretched cow with an old lady, St. Ambrose clarified it all with this simple sentence. That cow was her life. Without that cow, she would have lost her source of existence, she would have become despondent, her faith would have been endangered, and ultimately her salvation would have been endangered. That cow was her life. And because St. Ambrose knew that the only way he can express his love for his Christ is by loving Christ's sheep, and acting as a shepherd that doesn't run away screaming from a topic that is dangerous, St. Ambrose invested as much time as necessary in the cow, in the life of that woman, in full awareness that everyone else waiting outside are going to grow upset and are going to vent their frustration upon him at the end of all of it. And I've seen the same thing in Moldavia with our elders there. I've seen them, again, waste enormous amounts of time discussing the most trivial and insignificant to me as a young monastic who only wanted to talk about divine light and uh, all sorts of other topics of that kind, with just addressing every topic in the lives of those peasants. Because I was driven by my pride, and I was driven by my desire to affirm myself. I was driven by my need to see myself floating and shrouded in light. Whereas they were driven by their love for their Christ. And they were humbled and they were already crucified by this love. And they knew that they have to bow down. They have to bow down to descend to the level of the needs of the people in front of them. You may ask, well, how low should one bow? How low should one bow to discuss or to address the needs of one's brother or one's sister? Do we address their sinfulness? Do we address their fallenness? Well, I don't know. Let's, let's look at this together. Let's think about it together. Who is our God? Christ. Who are we followers of? Christ, right? Christ is the one whom we follow. What greater bow, what greater descent, what greater self-humiliation than for God himself to take the body of his own creation? What greater descend than the God of heavens who created all that is to take the body of his own creation in order to bow down to our needs, in order to make manifest his love for us, in order to make incarnate his love for us. What greater descent than that, than the Creator putting on this humble, 
clothing of his own creation than the Creator willingly putting himself on a cross and tasting death in his body for our sake. What greater descent, what greater act of self-emptying and bowing down in the name of love. What have we done that even compares to that? What is there that we can do that even compares to that? Absolutely nothing. Because even if we did exactly the same things, apart from the Incarnation, because we are already in this body, but if we followed Christ all the way to the cross, because we love Him and we want to make manifest our love for Him, if we taste death in the name of our love for Him and our neighbor, we still have not done the same thing. Our descent is still not of the same measure because we are creation dying according to the rules, to the nature of creation, whereas He was the uncreated Creator submitting himself, subjecting himself to the humility of the rules of our nature out of love alone. He descended from heaven into this body and with this body he further descended all the way into hell to save every single human being he created to offer the chance to salvation to every single human being ever created. Now, you decide what is the limit of your descent, of your willingness to bow down, and that limit that you impose upon your own self-emptying in the name of love is the limit of your love. And the limit that you impose upon the love entering your heart is the limit of your theology. Because what is theology but knowledge of God? And who is God but love? And if you limit the love, you limit the knowledge of that love, the knowledge of God in you. You limit yourself, you limit your chance to be saved. You see, <clears throat> simple things like that woman's cow are the incarnations of our faith. So, when you decide to wear or not to wear a mask, when you go to church or when you go shopping, that is your cow. Or maybe it is the cow of your neighbor. Either way, you disregard this big fat cow of your heart and of your neighbor. And in that disregard, you show your lack of love for God. You show your lack of God to the one who asks nothing of you except to love him and to manifest that love by loving your neighbor and your sister. <clears throat> you may think that this is something very harsh to say, but when you refuse to wear a mask, when you go to church, for instance, when you refuse to wear a mask and then you receive communion, when you refuse to wear a mask and then you kiss the icons and the objects in the church, you breathe into the air that others around you are breathing. When you put fear in the hearts of your brothers and your sisters who are more vulnerable than you are perhaps, or who are in the neighborhood, or who interact with other people who are more vulnerable than they are and than you are. <clears throat> when you do that, and by doing that, you stop them from approaching communion. You are the one who stops your brother and your sister from receiving communion, not the bishops of the church. Churches could be opened tomorrow now if all of us 
obeyed in humility to what our bishops ask of us. When your bishop tells you to wear a mask, you wear a mask because your bishop tells you so. If you don't, you have just exited, you have just left the protective veil of obedience to your bishop. You have left the protective veil of obedience to your church. And whether or not you are in church anymore, that is not mine to say, but it is a very serious question for you to address. When you enter a church in the name of your political belief, in the name of your human freedom, which is stupidly understood anyway, and you enter a church unprotected and you kiss an icon unprotected and you receive communion unprotected, you are the one who becomes a wall between your brother and Christ in the chalice, you and no one else. And you are going to answer for that in the Day of Judgment. Yes, of course I sound upset, because how could I not be upset? You, first of all, endanger the salvation of your brother and your sister who longs who is in pain with desire to receive the body and the blood of his or of her God, and you are the one stopping that. And even more important, for me at least, in my understanding of Christianity, you endanger your own salvation. <clears throat> if I am angry, I am angry because I want you saved my brother. I want you saved, my sister. And there is no salvation without obedience to the church. I pray for you. I know it seems like uh, because I address these topics and because I am very clear about what is right and what is wrong. And I am clear because things are very clear in my heart. And I know that what I say, I say with everything that I am, with all my heart, with all my being. And I know that that sounds like I'm, oh, ranting against you, but I'm doing it because I want to take you by the shoulders and I want you to look into my eyes and understand I have nothing against you. I love you and I fight to be able to love you even more. I don't want to distance myself from you. I don't want not to love you because you are my brother. <clears throat> it's not as if in my brain there is um, a part of humanity that does the things I think are right and they are my brothers and my sisters and them I love and then they are everyone else who do, does whatever else they, they want to do and I don't love them. If you fall in the other category, I actually struggle for you more than the others. I actually pray for you more than the others. I, and I do that again because all I want to do in my life is to the best of my ability to follow Christ. And Christ tells me and every one of us that if you have a hundred sheep and 99 are safely in the fold and one of them wanders in the desert or wanders in the mountain, leave behind the 99 safely at home and go out and try to find the one who's lost. And at this moment, my brother and my sister, although you don't know it, you are the lost sheep. If you do not obey to your bishop, if you do not obey to the church, you are the lost sheep. And it is my calling as a monk, as a priest, as a Christian, to do everything in my power to find you, to grab you by the shoulders with all my might and all my love and bring you back because I love you and because I want to follow him, our shepherd. May God 
teach us love. And we can learn love by sacrificing everything in ourselves for our neighbor, for our brothers and our sisters. It is in manifesting our love for them that we learn about God. Our brother, our sister, is the book of theology from whom we are going to gain true living and life-giving theology, knowledge of God, Theos and Logos. May that knowledge lead us to light, lead us to Christ, and you shall discover in that light, and you shall discover in the kingdom that I have nothing in me but love for all of you, with or without masks, but I still have to tell you the truth. May God bless all of us beyond our wildest dreams. Amen.